At this point, we've talked about how to handle statements with universal and existential quantifiers in both the assumption part of our proof and in the conclusion part of our proof. All that remains is to try to put some of these ideas together. To do this, let's look at a few more complicated examples. In these examples, we're going to be using a slightly different universe of discourse. We're going to use the interval from zero to infinity. What this notation represents is the set of all real numbers that are greater than zero. For our first example, we're going to prove the statement for all x in the real numbers if there are values of a and b in the interval from zero to infinity for which a is less than b times x, then there must be at least one value of c in the interval from zero to infinity for which c is less than x. For practice, we're going to try to prove this in two ways. First, using a direct proof, and second, using a proof by contraposition. In either case, we need to begin our proof by introducing x as an arbitrary real number. This is because we're trying to prove this statement holds for all values of x in the real numbers. Next, if we're going to be using a direct proof, we need to assume the full antecedent of our conditional statement. This reads, there are values of a and b in the interval from zero to infinity for which a is less than b times x. Since this assumption contains an existential quantifier, we need to use the principle of existential instantiation. This means that since we are told that values of a and b exist satisfying this inequality, but we are not told what those values are, all we can do is introduce a and b into our proof as unknown constants. We do this by making a statement along the lines of let a and b be elements of the interval from zero to infinity, satisfying the inequality a is less than b times x. Remember that we are not allowed to assign specific values to a and b because while our assumption tells us that values of a and b exist satisfying this inequality, it doesn't tell us any information about what those values are. And so the values of a and b must remain unknown. Turning our attention to the statement that we're required to demonstrate, which is the consequent of our conditional statement, we have to show that there is at least one value of c in the interval from zero to infinity for which c is less than x. In this case, because this is the statement that we're required to prove, we need to use the principle of existential generalization. You'll recall that to prove a statement with an existential quantifier, we need to provide a specific example. In other words, to show that a value of c exists satisfying this inequality, we need to give an example of a value of c that satisfies that inequality. This means we have to start with a statement along the lines of let c equal something specific. Existential generalization can be one of the hardest principles of logic to use. This is because it involves a little bit of creativity. We have to figure out exactly what value to assign to c that is going to make our demonstration work. To figure out what value we should assign to c, let's get out a piece of scrap paper. From our assumption, we know that we have unknown real numbers a and b, satisfying the inequality a is less than b times x. We also know that whatever these unknown values of a and b are, they're in the interval from zero to infinity, which means they're both greater than zero. What we're trying to get is an inequality that says c is less than x, and we can assign whatever value we want to the number c, because all we need to show is that there is at least one value for c that will satisfy this inequality. Looking at the inequality we get from our assumption, notice that since b is greater than zero, we know that b is not equal to zero. This means that b has a multiplicative inverse. We also know that since b is greater than zero, the inverse of b is also greater than zero. And so if we take our inequality and multiply on the left and right by the inverse of b, we know from axiom 04 that the order of the inequality will be preserved. This gives us the inequality AB inverse is less than x. You'll notice that this is exactly the type of inequality that we're looking for. We're trying to prove that there is something that is smaller than x. And so this might suggest that the value we should assign to C is the value AB inverse. Let's return to our proof. Letting C be the specific value A times B inverse, we should be able to quickly demonstrate that C is less than x. We can say, since we have the inequality, a is less than b times x, and since b is greater than zero, we also know that b inverse is greater than zero. By axiom 04, this allows us to multiply b inverse on both sides of our inequality, giving us a b inverse on the left-hand side, and simply x on the right-hand side. 
In other words, we've demonstrated that for our specific value of c, c is less than x. There is, however, one more issue we need to take care of. The conclusion that we're trying to demonstrate is not just that there's a real number, c, that's less than x, it's that there's a real number in the interval from 0 to infinity that's less than x. And so we also need to demonstrate that the value of c we've chosen is in the right place. We need to demonstrate that the value of c is greater than 0. To do this, we can make use of the fact that both a and b are greater than 0 beginning with the inequality that says a is bigger than zero, and using the fact that b inverse is greater than zero, we can multiply b inverse on both sides, and by axiom O4, the order of the inequality will be unchanged. This gives us the inequality a b inverse is greater than zero, which means our value of c is greater than zero. In other words, c is in the interval we want it to be in. Since we've successfully shown that there is a specific value of c in the interval from zero to infinity that satisfies the inequality c is less than x, the principle of existential generalization allows us to conclude that there is at least one value of c in the interval from zero to infinity for which c is less than x. And we can now draw the remaining conclusions. Let's take a look now at how this proof would look if we were using a proof by contraposition. Again, since we're proving that this statement is true for all values of x in the real numbers, we need to let x be an arbitrary real number. Next, if we're using a proof by contraposition, we need to assume that the consequent of our conditional statement is false. In other words, we need to assume for all values of c in the interval from 0 to infinity, x is less than or equal to c. We are then required to demonstrate that the antecedent is false. In other words, we need to demonstrate for all values of a and b, in the interval from 0 to infinity, b times x is less than or equal to a. One thing we can notice is that the statement we're trying to demonstrate begins with a universal quantifier. This means we need to use the principle of universal generalization to prove a statement is true for all values of a and b in the interval from 0 to infinity. We need to prove that it's true for arbitrary values of a and b in that interval. This means at this point we need to introduce into our proof two more arbitrary constants a and b. We do this with a statement that says let a and b be elements of the interval from 0 to infinity. For these values of a and b, we're now required to demonstrate that b times x must be less than or equal to a. In order to demonstrate this, we're going to need to make use of our assumption in some way. And since our assumption includes a universal quantifier, we know that we need to use the principle of universal instantiation. This says if we've made an assumption for all values of c, then to use that assumption, we need to talk about some specific value or values of c. The difficulty with this is knowing what value or values of c we want to talk about. We want to make sure that whatever value of c or values of c we choose to introduce will lead us to some information that we need. Borrowing an idea from our direct proof, we might choose to talk about the value of c that is a times b inverse. If we can show that a times b inverse is in the interval from 0 to infinity, then we'll know that that's one of the many values of c that we can choose to talk about. Showing this is not too difficult, since we know that a and b individually are in the interval from 0 to infinity, we can say that both a and b are greater than 0. This means that b inverse is also greater than 0, and so we can take the inequality that says a is greater than 0 and multiply on both sides by b inverse. This this gives us the expression a times b inverse is greater than zero, meaning a times b inverse is in the interval from zero to infinity. Next, applying the principle of universal instantiation, we can say that since our assumption holds for all values of c in the interval from zero to infinity, it must hold for the value a b inverse. In other words, we can say since a b inverse is in the interval from zero to infinity, our assumption guarantees that x is less than or equal to a b inverse. Next, keeping in mind that we're trying to demonstrate the inequality b times x is less than or equal to a, we can take our inequality x is less than or equal to a times b inverse, and since b is greater than zero, we can multiply on both sides by b. This gives us b times x is less than or equal to a, which is exactly what we're trying to demonstrate. Piecing the conclusions together, we can see that since this demonstration has been done for arbitrary constants a and b in the interval from 0 to infinity, we can make the conclusion that this inequality, b times x is less than or equal to a, holds for all values of a and b in that interval.
Next, we can say that since all of that was done under our assumption, the principle of conditional proof allows us to conclude if our assumption holds, then our conclusion holds. Writing this conditional statement in its contrapositive form gives us the conditional statement that we're trying to prove. And finally, we can conclude that since x was arbitrary, this holds for all values of x in the real numbers.